Nobody will know what the future will bring, but still today I will tell you what the future of mobility will be. And when I say that from the scientific point of view, what I mean is, I want to answer the question, what is the ideal technology with today's knowledge about the limits of technology and the limits of our ecosystems? So I will talk about those kind of future technologies where we know they will be possible in the next few years or even starting today. And it will be a scientific projection of our knowledge. So welcome to our lecture number 29 on the future of energy. When I talk about the future of mobility, I don't talk about some exotic ideas on what we can do in future, but I talk about the mass transport, which is essential to our society, transport as well of people as of goods. So there may be a lot of things which may be possible for a handful of privileged people. But for example, imagine flight taxes will be possible or are already possible today. But imagine hundreds of thousands of people in a big town going up in the morning like bees and colliding in the sky there. I also do not talk about traveling to other planets because if you think about it, of course, any new planet will always be worse from the ecological point of view compared to our planet. Even if we destroy most of the life on our planet, it is still much easier for a human being to live on our destroyed Earth instead of going to a planet where there is, for example, an atmosphere which you cannot breathe. In the previous lecture, I explained you that the way we do mobility nowadays is not suitable for the future. All the traffic we have today is almost 100% based on fossil fuels and therefore it emits greenhouse gases at a huge amount. And this is against the Paris Agreement and it will destroy our future if we continue like that. The other point I explained you already in lecture number 16 is that our future energy system has as a primary source electricity, so not oil anymore. If we want to produce synthetic fuels or hydrogen, we have to derive it from electricity and this is a very inefficient way. In addition, we have to know that during the energy transition in the next decades, of course, energy will be scarce. Even though there is plenty of energy available from the sun and the wind, it is not available for people for making electricity because we need huge investments and these investments will need a lot of time. So you cannot expect that we have enough renewable energy sources in the coming decades. Also, nuclear energy will not help globally, as I explained in one of my previous lectures. So putting now energy into fossil and nuclear industry will even slow down the transition to renewable energies. And therefore, we should try to avoid that and go immediately to an electricity-based transport system. So here it's summarized. How will the future of mobility have to look like in the global scale? Well, the first problem I mentioned was that fossil fuels have to be stopped. The second point is that renewable energies will be scarce. We have to try to live with little energy for transport and primary energy sources will be electricity. So they will come from wind and sun and hydro. And whenever you try to make renewable fuels, then you will lose at least a factor of two in efficiency. So this is not the first option for us because we want to have a sustainable system which uses as less resources as possible. Of course, biofuel is an option, but already here we discussed in previous lectures that there will not be enough biofuel available. So we have to go to electricity-based transport. So in the coming slides, I will show you the main steps to go to a sustainable and renewable transport system. So step number one is we should try to reduce the transport of goods. How do we do that? Well, the first thing is we go to local food and we go to local products in general. This is something which has been done in previous centuries all the time and we have to go back to it when we realize that transport on a big scale, on a global scale, is not good for the environment. 
Of course, there are always goods which you have to get from abroad. In the ancient days, it was, for example, salt, which people from Germany imported from far away, or pepper and those things. But of course, these are limited amounts of good. We should not produce, for example, toys for children in Europe, in Asian countries, if the same way we could do it locally. Another option to reduce the transport of good is if we reduce our consumption. A lot of the production and consumption of the goods is not really essential for our living. So especially we should not produce short-lived consumer articles uh, which are thrown away after a few days or after a few months if it's not really necessary to have these goods. The next point is to go, as I mentioned already before, to local factories. In those cases where it makes sense, sometimes it does not make sense, but in most of the cases it makes a lot of sense to have local factories instead of this globalized market, which is bad from the ecological point of view. We need less globalization, at least in, from the point of the production and transport of goods. This localized production is easy nowadays when we have electronic design plans which we can transport over the internet. We can have 3D printers, we can have CNC machines which produce the same articles at different places on the world with the same program but at different locations. So you don't need to transport the products, you just transport the information about how to produce it. And of course, a lot of things are thrown away when they are broken. This is also most of the time not necessary. Often it's just a small piece which is broken, which can be replaced. So it's very important for the future to have repairable equipment and if possible those equipment should have standardized components so that anybody can replace those components when one of them is broken. Another thing which makes life much easier from the point of repairing nowadays is that you have this beautiful internet where you have repair videos for almost all articles nowadays. So if there's some skilled persons, they could build a repair shop and repair all the things, even if they are quite complicated. For that, of course, you also need spare and wheel part shops where you can buy all the articles uh, which you need for the repair. Now we come to step number two. So in addition to reducing the transport of goods, we should also reduce the transport of people. And the first kind of transport which can be reduced significantly is all the people which go on a long trip to work in the morning and come back in the evening. To do that, there are several possibilities. First of all, living and working should be in the same area. We should not have city centers where people only work and we should not have areas where people only sleep. We should have small towns like in the previous centuries where work and living and social activities were combined in one area. So we have to merge the residential and the work areas. The next step, which is also very efficient, is to have a lot of work done at the home office. Since the corona crisis, everybody realizes that there's a lot of possibilities here and a lot of work can be done at home. But of course, a lot of people don't like to work alone at home all the time. So you need to have colleagues around and to do so in your local area, the invention for that is what you call co-working space. So it's people from the region who sit together in an office and work together every day, even though they work for different companies, they still work in the same office. So they have their colleagues, they can have a coffee together and they can discuss about their problems and at the same time they do work in this social surrounding. Of course this is not ideal for a company but maybe people can at least work part-time in these co-working offices and only go to their own company for example once per week or once per month. Another thing where we got a lot of experience is with video conferences so video conferences are an ideal way to reduce business trips and they even enlarge the scope. Since I do video conferences extensively since a year now, 
For me here in Europe, it's much easier to cooperate with my colleagues in Siberia, for example, because every meeting is online anyway. I can attend all the meetings every few weeks. And uh, this makes it much easier instead of taking a plane and flying for one day to an area far abroad. And last but not least, we come to the business trips and to the vacations of people. Of course, sometimes it's important to do business trips to see the people where you are working with or where you are dealing with. For getting a real feeling uh, of people, you have to meet them in person. But of course, you can reduce these numbers of business trips. And especially what I advise is, is that you do not take all these far distance short trips that you go for one or two days to uh, the US for a few days to Siberia and to Japan. This sounds efficient, but I think most of those short meetings can be done by video conference. If you really want to cooperate with some person abroad for a long time, please go there and stay there for a month or two. And then the travel is worth it. Travel um, and instead of going 10 times for two days, you go once for two months. And then in the overall effects, it's not only much better for the ecosystem, but it's probably also better for the relation with your company abroad. The same is true for vacations. I don't want to stop anybody from vacations, but please don't go shopping uh, to Paris and next time to Moscow and have this lot of short trips. Instead, have your short trips in your local area. And if you really want to do vacations abroad, go there for a few months or half a year and then really experience in your vacations a foreign country properly. And of course, you can always travel CO2 neutral in future. And now I come to a last point about the reduction of transportation of goods, which many people see critical. I think online shopping and delivery services are a great thing. They reduce quite a lot the transport of people. I know many people don't like Amazon and these big companies who make a lot of money from that. But we have to distinguish between the basic idea of a delivery service and of online shopping and the realization of that. So I believe that with a good online shopping system, you can save a lot of transport of people. A lot of people just buy a big car in order to be able to carry things back home uh, when they go shopping. If there would be a delivery service in town which brings it to your home, then you would not need a big car. You can take the bus or the tram. And secondly, um, you don't always have to go to the shop to buy something. One example is on Sunday morning here in Germany, people like to go by car to the bakery, to buy some fresh bread, and then you see hundreds of cars in your area just driving around in the morning to get the bread. I get my fresh bread on Sunday from a delivery service. So there's one person going around and putting the bread to all the households. And then you need only one person driving around and not hundreds of them. So delivery service is a good thing. Of course, it has to be organized in the way uh, that not all the money which is made by the system goes to a foreign company without paying taxes. And the second thing is, of course, we have so many package delivery services in Germany that in my area every day there are three, four, five different cars coming to bring a package to somebody. Of course, it would be much more efficient from the ecological point of view if there would be only one car for one area. So all the packages which go to a certain area should be delivered by one car. And I don't care who is doing that, but it's important, of course, that there are not so many cars driving around on the same area. Now we come to the step number three. Here we talk about short distance transport. And my point of view is that we should do short distance transport either by walking or by using light vehicles. The only way where you have to walk long distances, what people really accept is if you are on an airport. Nobody complains that he has to walk a long distance from one terminal to the other. 
This seems even to be cool if you walk for 10 minutes around in an airport, nobody complains. But for your shopping, you want to go from one supermarket to the next one with your car, because these 200 meters there are too far away to do by walking. Another strange aspect is that people who realize that walking and going by bike is very important for your health, they take their car, drive to a gym, and then they go on a treadmill or they do some spinning exercises, whereas it would be much more natural to do this in your daily life. So to go shopping by feet, to go to work with a bicycle, because then you have your exercise for your health already during normal life and you can also meet people here and have social contacts if you are walking around in a shopping area. But of course you cannot do everything by walking and not everybody is fit for a bicycle, but there are different means nowadays. A very convenient thing is an e-bike. This increases the radius which you are willing to do by bike, I think by something like a factor of five or so at least. And of course you have e-scooters and all kind of other modern ways to do short distance transport, which is of course very energy efficient. If you are an older person and if you are not so fit that you can go by bike, of course, if you are really handicapped, you can have an e-wheelchairs nowadays, which you can use for transport or, or if you put a roof on your wheelchair, we call it car. So a car is nothing else than a vehicle which has typically four or five chairs on wheels and therefore these cars are very much liked by the people. Of course the cars should be light to use less energy. They should have batteries and electric engines of course for high efficiencies. And what is also important is that these vehicles are shared. So in the best case, you just pick it up at the bus station and go home with it. Or you share it with some other people in the area. Because if everybody would have an electric vehicle, the roads would look like today. Everything is parked full of these cars and there's no space for anything else in town anymore. And last not least, of course, the same is true for transport. So for transport, you can have nowadays modern e-bikes with all kinds of ways to add area for transport there. And of course you have the battery cars, which you can also use for transporting goods nowadays. I think with these options, the short distance transport is well organized. And I think the problem of short distances is solved this way. Now we go to step four. What about big cities? If you have big cities, the distances are quite often quite long. So it is in many cases not possible to go by bike anymore in an efficient way. And of course also it is not possible if all the people in a huge town have electric EVs. But the most efficient way here of course is the subway. Subways are the most efficient ways to transport people in dense areas. Of course a subway system has to be efficient, which is not so easy if there's a huge amount of people to be transported. Um, at rush hour, of course, you need a lot of trains, a lot of long trains. And during night times, for example, it is important that there are still trains going, because otherwise people who stay on night shifts or who stay in amusement areas late in the evening, they have no way to get back again by public transport. So therefore, during night, you have to have also subways going. But of course, it would be inefficient if these long trains uh, go also at night. So you have to reduce the size of the trains and the frequency of the trains. But it's important that still regularly, all times of the day, there is trains going. Now, the next point is, of course, uh, these subways have to go to the suburbs. So in many towns, the subways go underground in the city and they go overground if they go out of the city. And the other problem for the people using subways is of course how to get to the subway from home and how to go from the subway to work or to the shopping area. So of course also here we need something for the last kilometer. And this, of course, could be a shared e-scooter or e-bike or a 
electric shuttle bus. So these four steps, I think, explained you how the future transport should be organized. But the step five is missing and the step five is unfortunately the main problem and the most difficult one to solve. So the step five is about mobility in rural areas, in small towns and in suburbs. So in those areas which are not big enough to have subways. The next open step is the mobility for long distance traveling and also the transports of goods for medium and long distances. So the small battery driven lorries, they are not sufficient to do overland transport of good at large scale. These three points are still open and I think I have a solution for that which solve all these three things with one mean of transport. Before I explain you what I propose, I explain you what the automotive industry is dreaming about. What they want, of course, is they want to continue the individual transport of people and goods using cars and lorries. And of course, because it has to be greenhouse gas neutral, they propose to use hydrogen or other synthetic fuels to do so. Unfortunately, I completely disagree to this future option, which is now widely discussed everywhere, also in the European Parliament, for example. I think there's a showstopper which we have to take seriously. The point is, this individual traffic has a large energy consumption, and this large energy consumption has three components. The first one is that you have to produce fuel for it, so either hydrogen or some other synthetic fuels, and this fuel production is very inefficient because it has to be done by using valuable electricity and you lose at least 50% by the step from electricity to the synthetic fuels. The next step is the low efficiency of these engines. If you want to use hydrogen or synthetic fuels, you use another at least 40% of energy by the conversion of these fuels into motion, whereas an electric engine has a much higher efficiency. And the third point is that the friction of these individual cars and trucks is much too large. And as I showed you in the previous lecture, we can do much better. I'm sure that we can do at least better by a factor of 10 if we go to a different system, which I propose now. And I think due to the ecological problems we have, it's something we really have to do better. To explain that, let's go back to lecture number 28, where we summarized the energy consumption of transport. Just shortly, let us repeat the main points. First of all, the rolling resistance of cars is almost a factor of five higher than if you go to rails. So I think we should go to rails if possible. The air drag depends on the speed and on the shape of the vehicle. If we go to trains, they have a long shape with a relatively small cross-section. There we are in a big advantage as well. Then a lot of energy is used when you go uphill or if you accelerate your car. And these energies you can get back if you have recuperation. So we need an efficient recuperation of the engine. Then we need an engine which has a high efficiency. And there, as I showed you, electricity can go above 80, 90 percent, whereas a combustion engine and even fuel cells have an efficiency which loses about half of the energy. And the consequence of that is what is shown on the other side here. We should go to rails if possible. These trains should not be too heavy. They should not be too fast. They should have a limited cross-section and a large length. They should have electric engines. They should have overline for an efficient energy transport. They should be able to recuperate to the grid and to their batteries. And of course, these trains should have a high occupancy. So there should be many people and many goods transported at the same time. And of course, uh, these trains should not run around all day and night without having passengers. So we should somehow need a new way of trains for the future. And I really think we can save a factor of 10 in energy or transport in the future this way.
So my proposal is to rethink what a train is, what a tram is, and make a new system of trams and trains. I call it the speed tram, so the speed tram should have a version for passengers, the speed tram should have a version for cargo, and last not least, my worst proposal at the end, the speed tram should go on the autobahn. So we need a new kind of autobahn, a new kind of highway, and on this highway you have a lane for cars, but you also have a lane only reserved for the speed tram. And I know people hate me because of this idea here. And I know that especially in Germany, cars and autobahns are a sacrilege. But nevertheless, as a scientist, I just propose what is the best option. I don't care if people want it or not. I'm not responsible for building this new autobahn, but I feel responsible to tell the people that there are options which are not thought about, and these options are, to my mind, a factor of 10 better than all the other proposals. The details of how these speed trams work, how they look like, and how they are operated is so complex that I will have a separate video about that. So we are at the end of this video about the future of mobility now. And I hope you are a little bit curious now to learn how these speed trams work in future. Thank you and hope to see you again next time. Goodbye. Thank you.